We're joined by Dr. G. Scott Hubbard, former NASA Ames Center Director, joining us from California. Dr. Hubbard, thanks for being with us. It's been 20 years since the Columbia disaster. Uh, take us back and share how that day went from your perspective. It was uh, 6.30 in the morning, my time on the West Coast. And uh, my wife and I were awake, uh, but not up yet. Uh, and she said, listen to this. And she turned up the radio and the announcer said, the shuttle Columbia is overdue. And I knew that there was no such thing as an overdue shuttle. Once you commit to re-enter the atmosphere, it's a big, heavy glider. So I had a terrible feeling that something awful had happened. So I raced upstairs uh, where the television is. I grabbed my cell phone and uh, snapped on the TV and saw what many in the nation and the world were seeing, which was these streaks over Texas that turned out, of course, to be the shuttle breaking up. My cell phone rang and it was the administrator of NASA. And uh, he said, uh, we have a terrible problem. It's probably loss of crew and vehicle we're activating our contingency plan, and there's a spot on the commission that will investigate the accident for one and one only NASA person, and uh, we would like you to be that, that person. Um, and I immediately agreed to uh, to serve my agency in the country. Uh, they originally thought it would be for 30 days, and it turned out to take seven months for us to figure out what happened and write the report. What did you conclude after those seven months of investigations? I mean, what lessons were learned? We found two things. On one hand, uh, I did on live nationwide television, a demonstration of the physical cause of the accident, which was the foam falling off of the so-called main tank of the shuttle hitting the leading edge and blowing a hole uh, upon launch, actually. It was uh, just about 80 seconds after launch, and it was unknown that it was there. So when the shuttle re-entered the atmosphere, the hot gas uh, basically melted the shuttle and destroyed it. But we also learned a lot about the organizational causes, the um, lack of attention to certain safety issues since Challenger happened um, years before. And uh, those caused NASA to take a very hard look at how they conducted safety operations and to institute some new procedures. Finally, um, we made the recommendation as a board that NASA needed to either completely recertify the shuttle or do something different. And in the end, NASA chose to do something different and and now has successfully launched uh, the Artemis rocket, which is very much like the Saturn V. How does NASA commemorate you know, the crew of Columbia? And at the same time, you mentioned Artemis. How's it preparing for a new era of crewed spaceflight? NASA holds a day of celebration that just occurred. And every year, it's to commemorate the astronauts that were lost in the Apollo 1 fire, the astronauts that were lost in the Challenger accident, and the astronauts that were lost in the Columbia tragedy. And that's a day of acknowledging these heroes who gave their life in the service of space exploration, uh, and also to remind people that it is a high-risk business. You do everything you can to ensure mission success, but you're still taking some extraordinary risk. And now uh, NASA has successfully launched the new Artemis rocket, the most powerful rocket in the world at the moment. And the intent is to return to the moon uh, within a few years. Ani Lan Ramon, I mean, he meant so much to this embattled nation in those years. Uh, despite the tragic ending, obviously, to the mission, did his participation herald in a, a new chapter of collaborations or joint research ventures? NASA has always had a policy of working with other countries. Uh, Ilan Ramon was the first Israeli astronaut. Um, and I'm sure there will be many more opportunities for collaboration because 
The world is seeing an amazing expansion of space capability. Companies like SpaceX, Blue Origin, and others have brought a new commercial entrepreneurial effort into the space exploration enterprise. So I think that we're going to see more and more and more space exploration. Uh, NASA, ESA, and other agencies will uh, lead the uh, the pointy end of the spear, if you will, the, the rockets that uh, go off and explore uh, other worlds uh, in the solar system. But this commercial enterprise with uh, Bob and Doug, uh, Bob Minkin and Doug Hurley, uh, the landing of the Space X vehicles <clears throat> on a tail of fire. <laughs> this is all just incredibly exciting. Uh, what can you tell us more about these joint ventures or how the Middle East is involved? Saudi Arabia, UAE, Iran, even others. But is it all being driven, though, by, by these private companies? You mentioned SpaceX, Blue Origin. I think entrepreneurial space uh, has definitely been driven by SpaceX, uh, Blue Origin, Virgin Galactic, and so forth. Uh, but what has also happened uh, is that other countries, you mentioned uh, the HOPE mission of the United Arab Emirates. Uh, this was very much a collaboration between the UAE and the University of Colorado in the United States that did a lot of the work in developing the, the spacecraft. Uh, but it shows how other countries, those of financial means, can in fact uh, work in a collaborative way and in the case of the HOPE mission, uh, explore Mars. So I, I think we're seeing this space ecosystem expanding and uh, it will continue to do that. Thank you very much for your time, Dr. Hubbard.